Hey everyone again. Um, we'll do this all in English because we have our guest here. We want him to be able to understand everything that we say. So we welcome Nate Molberg here today. Nate is an assistant coach on the Olympic national team. Uh, he's also an assistant coach in Richmond, Richmond, Virginia now. He's going to tell you a little bit more about what he does and, <clears throat> and what it is. But we thought it's a great opportunity for you guys, especially uh, thinking about college baseball or the next step after the army or after whatever it is that we're at. Um, and we have a very, very, very good opportunity here to get that knowledge and get that insight, uh, something that we don't have here. I mean, you have to, I mean, I guess, Nate, there's more knowledge now than I guess when, when, when Moish came over or when I went or, or those ideas. So people are more aware and there's more of a sense of what it's like, but still, I mean, it's so far out of this culture. Right. Uh, college life in general, right? And specifically, you know, college athletics. Uh, it's something that, you know, like there's no high school ball here. You know, there, there's none of this doesn't exist. So, um, so hopefully they'll be able to get some insight and uh, like we did before, they'll be able to ask some questions. Uh, we're gonna try, I'm, gonna, I'm, not, gonna not, I'm not gonna mute you. Uh, try and just keep yourself on mute unless you want to say something. That will avoid background noise and everything and this will run. Uh, properly. All right. Uh, so Nate, the floor is yours. You're Great. Team. Thank you, Ophir. So thank you for having me, guys. Thank you for coming out uh, to, to meet with me and talk and maybe learn some new things. So kind of the plan that I have for today um, is one, I wanted to do just a little brief activity, just kind of a, re a reflection activity that I think is, is healthy and good to do from time to time that we do with some of our players. Um, and then I just wanted to open up the floor to let you ask any questions you may have. So just to give some background about me, uh, like Ophir said, I'm one of the assistant coaches on the Olympic national team. Um, I'm jealous of all you guys who live in Israel because I love Israel. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. If I didn't have so much going on here in the States, um, I truly believe I would move to Israel. I love it that much. So I think you guys are all very lucky. Um, and I'm envious of you guys for that. Um, like Ophir mentioned, I actually played with an Israeli in college. His name is Moish Lewis. Some of you guys may know him. So I went to the University of Rochester, which is a Division Three school in New York. And Moish Lewis was one of my teammates, and he is an Israeli. So that was very cool. Um, and currently, like Ophir said, I am a coach at the University of Richmond, which is a Division I school located in Virginia. So it's in the southern part of the state, pretty close to North Carolina, really good weather, and uh, probably the best player to ever come out of Richmond, a guy by the name of Sean Casey. He was in the major leagues about 15 years ago. He was a major league all-star, so we've had some really good players. So the first thing I wanted to do, just taking five minutes, um, you can write it down if you're on your computer, obviously, you can type it. I wanted you guys to answer really three questions that I have for you. Um, could be short, we're not even gonna share this, it's just for your own personal reflection. Um, so the first question is, why do you play baseball? Like what's, what's the, the reason, why do you play? I think that's an important question to ask yourself if you haven't already. What's the reason? It could be because it's fun. Maybe you have goals to play at a high level, but just why do you play? Second question is, what is your dream? Don't care what it is. It could be a dream with baseball, a dream in life, something you're hoping to do. Just what is your ultimate dream? And then the last question is, obviously in the world right now, we're dealing with a lot being dealing with coronavirus so just pick out one thing that you've been able to do given the circumstances because of having to be at home a lot that you otherwise would not have been able to do so a positive of there being a coronavirus if that makes sense okay so just take a couple of minutes and then we'll do that and then we'll, we'll rejoin
and I wrote in the group, if you forget what the questions are, all the, the questions are listed. And then if you could just press you raise your hand when you finish so that we have an idea people are finishing. All right, we'll just take another minute or so and then we'll uh, we'll get ready to move on. Like I said, when you start to finish, if you just put your hand up, but um, that way we have an idea, but then we'll we'll keep moving. And I want you all to understand as you're doing this, there is a reason why I asked you to do this, and I'll explain why once we uh, we start to wrap this up. So just take like one more minute and then we'll get moving. All right, guys, so I'm just going to start kind of the reflection part about why I asked you to do that. If you're finishing up, that's perfectly fine. Um, and then uh, I'm just going to take about two more minutes just to talk about my thoughts. And then I want to open up the floor to answer any questions you guys may have. So uh, the first thing I wanted to say is, you know, with the kids that I coach at Richmond at the college level, they're all between the ages of 18 and 23 depending on if they're a graduate student or right out of high school. So I know for you guys, having your military service, you'll probably be in your 20s, 21, 22, around when you go to college. Uh, I think that's great. One, physically, you're going to be a lot more mature and developed than a lot of the younger kids. And I think from a mental standpoint, you guys will start to really understand you know, what the whole point of this is. So for me, one of the issues that I have with a lot of college players that I coach and have worked with is that I think a lot of guys, they don't understand why they're playing the game. Okay, they just kind of do it. And I think in life, it's important that you do everything that you choose to do with a purpose. And I think that allows you to become your best self. So why do you play baseball? Okay, if you just do it because you feel like you have to, it's not a great reason. Um, doesn't mean you shouldn't play, but nobody has to do anything. If you do it to have fun, that's a great reason. If you're doing it because you have goals to play at a further level after college, that's a great reason. But I think everything you do, it's really important. You reflect from time to time, 
why are we doing this? There's so many options to do different things in life. So you wanna make sure the things that you choose to do, it has purpose. Um, the second question, what is your dream in life or just anything? So I think that's important as well. Um, we all have dreams and to write it down from time to time and reflect on that. I talk to our players about that a lot because here's the thing, unfortunately, most people in today's world will never accomplish their ultimate dream. It's just how it is. But it doesn't mean you shouldn't set your goals and sights very high because what it can do is it can help set you up with the right behaviors and practices to become your best self. To give you an example, I played Division Three baseball at the University of Rochester. My dream growing up was always to be a Division I baseball player and play in the major leagues. I played Division Three, which is really good baseball, but it's a step below Division I. Um, and I did not play professional baseball. But because I had that in my head all those years growing up, now I have a chance to be part of an Olympic team as a coach. Now I have a chance to coach at the Division I level. Um, I get to work with guys like Danny Valencia, who I know you spoke with the other day. And my point is, is that I truly believe in my heart that because I had this mindset of, hey, since I was 12 years old, my dream is to be in the major leagues. I made a lot of good decisions over the years that helped me get to this point today. So I think in the back of your head, it's always good to say, what are you trying to accomplish? How can I get there? And then just the last question I had you do, positive of being home. I think it's very easy to be negative about everything. We can all be negative about the things we do not have. I've been asked so many times, you know, how much does this stink that we have to be home? Or how upset are you that the Olympics were postponed? Of course I'm upset, but the thing is the most successful people, they can have a mindset of, hey, here's the situation, we're gonna make the best of it. And that applies to baseball, because look what happens. You're playing the field, you make an error. You made the mistake that cost the team the game. You have to have some perspective about that because at the end of the day, you're gonna get another chance. You know, when we're all home right now with the coronavirus, we all have a chance to do something special. I know Ophir has been setting up a lot of great opportunities for you to talk to people or do different practices and baseball activities at home. You get to spend time with your family you otherwise may not be able to. So you have to look at the positive of things and just make the best of every situation. And if you do that, you are setting yourself up for success. So that's what I got, Ophir. I'm happy to uh, answer any questions and, and open up the floor. Yeah, all right. <clears throat> um, perfect. I, and I think this is, you know, again, I won't, I, won't, I won't get into it too long, but these things are important. And these are questions that you have to kind of revisit yourself every, every so often, every whatever period uh, that it is. Um, so I will, uh, ask you some questions. We got a bunch of questions from the kids earlier. I kind of put them a little bit together. So we're not, uh, asking more. Okay. So we'll start, um, we'll kind of take a look at the recruiting process. So what does it mean to take? So let's start from a little bit more general point of view of, so basically if you're recruiting a player, let's start with a very basic thing. I mean, what are you looking for? I mean, you come to a tryout or you come to whatever, it doesn't matter. What? What are you looking for? What are the first things that go through your mind? What are the first things that catch your eye? I mean, what is it? For sure. Um, so the biggest thing you need to understand, um, and, and I've actually come across, so, you know, I, I've, I've met Zev in person at a recruiting event before. I've met his brother, Eitan, and we've talked about these things. And, you know, I know some of you guys from when I was in Israel a couple of weeks back. Uh, and I, I talked to some of you guys about this, but here's the biggest thing you need to understand. There are thousands upon thousands of kids all across the world who want to play college baseball and want to play in the majors. Um, it is really hard as a college coach to get recruiting right all the time. Meaning we bring in players to our program who absolutely stink or we bring in kids to our program, who when we talk to them in the recruiting process, we say, they seem like the best kid ever. And then when they get to Richmond or another school, they're a train wreck. Like they're all over the place. They're late for practice. It's just a mess. So that's the first thing to understand is that if a coach does not necessarily take interest in you, do not be insulted. Just understand 
there's so many players out there and we're doing our best to try to identify as best we can, but every coach is wrong just as much, if not more than they are right about a player. So what do I look for? Um, it, it really is subjective. You know, I think that when you're coaching at the division one level, I'm really looking for the whole package, meaning I want a kid who's athletic, who can run fast, who is strong, can make consistent contact, has good fielding ability. If you've ever heard of what is called the five tools in baseball, so that's kind of a term that a lot of scouts use. Do you have power as a hitter? Can you make contact consistently? Can you throw hard? Can you field and can you run? Those are the five tools. Um, as a division one coach, in general, I'm looking for a guy who has three of those tools. If a kid has five tools out of high school, or maybe out of you know the military like you guys, he's getting drafted. He's getting drafted right away, unless he's a pitcher, you throw hard, stuff like that. Um, so I'm looking for a guy who's got multiple tools. They can run and they can hit, or they can run, they can field really well, maybe they're an okay hitter. Um, and it just varies by guy. I think from your standpoint, you have to keep this in mind. For division one, there's over 350 different schools. There's division two schools, 200, 300 division two schools. You know, there's 400 division three schools. Um, you know, I'm sure a lot of you guys know Asaf. He went to a junior college. Uh, Tal, you guys all know Tal. He went to a junior college. Now he's at Lynn University, which is division two. So from your standpoint, don't pigeonhole. And when I say pigeonhole, I mean, don't narrow down your college options too much. I think Asaf and Tal have done a great job because they've had this open mind of they just want to play and they're going to go wherever they can play and make the best out of it. And that's what both those guys have done. Asaf called me back in January because he had to switch schools. He moved from California all the way to New York. And that was amazing. But he has the right mindset. That's why he's been so successful. Good. Um, yeah. So well, you're talking about those five tools. And I guess everyone's trying to look for that one thing specific. And at least from the questions, you know, to see what is more important than others. Um, than, than others, you know, I mean, is it more important to, to hit than to field? I mean, that would be, that'd be a, a basic question, I think, if you could say. What, you think hitting would be more important than fielding? All I, things being equal, I guess. Yeah, I, I think it's going to vary. So I think what you have to ask yourself, seriously, look yourself in the mirror. What is your best chance to be successful? Okay. Mm -hmm. If you're not the best hitter, but you're really fast, you better develop that speed as best as you can. That's a huge differentiating factor. I've heard of guys who couldn't hit. They were okay fielders, but they ran a 6.2 60-yard dash. And now all of a sudden coaches want them because that's game-changing speed, right? You know, if you feel like hitting is your strength, that's great. Make that happen. For me... I will tell you one thing that is kind of a non-negotiable for me. This is differing by coach. You have to be able to play a position defensively. Mm -hmm. I say that because you guys know this. Hitting is really hard. Okay? Hitting is really hard. The best hitters get out a lot. So if the only thing you can do is hit, like you're a great hitter and that's all you can do, but you're a terrible defensive first baseman. So you have nowhere to play in the field. That means that you only provide value to your team if you're hitting really, really well. And if you go through a slump, you're struggling. Your coach can't even get value out of you putting you in the field because you're not good defensively. Defense in general shouldn't really slump. Guys who are good at defense are usually always good at defense. Guys who are good pitchers, yeah, they may have a bad game here or there, but they're usually good pitchers. Hitting is up and down, up and down, up and down. So, you know, focus on what you're really good at. If it's running, get your speed as good as possible. If you're not that fast, focus on your defense. Hitting, same thing. But with that, it's really important that you at least are able to play defense at a solid level. So even when you struggle offensively, your coach can still get value out of you in the field. Mm -hmm. I, so to bounce off that a little bit, and I think this is a question that will uh, relate to a lot of them. How, 
uh, how important is the position that you're looking at? I mean, let's say you were recruiting and you see a, a first baseman or an outfielder or a second baseman. Uh, do you look at him more as an athlete and where could you fit him into your program? Or do you really care if he's a second baseman? Uh, or you like in your head can see yourself saying like, oh, I mean, I see him playing second, but I actually need a left fielder or, you know, things like that. I mean, is that is that position very something that you really look into or is it something that you're like, I can do... I, I can do it for them. I'll, I'll make it wherever I want him to be. Yeah, for sure. So I think in general, okay, if you're a catcher, that's a really important position. So that's great. If you play the infield, even if you are not a shortstop, when I say that, you know, shortstop's a very hard position. I think it's important if you play the infield to work at shortstop. I'm telling you right now, our first baseman at Richmond, I put them at shortstop, including the first baseman who are left-handed. So at practice, I'll put them at shortstop to develop some new skills. Have fun with it, but take it seriously. Because see, the thing is, is traditionally in America, what I have seen is that the guys who play shortstop, I can put wherever they want around the field. Mm -hmm. um, we need second baseman. We need first baseman. We need outfielders. But shortstop, it's a longer throw tougher hop sometimes. So my recommendation to all you guys is get some practice playing shortstop, no matter where you play in the field. I think that would really help. Um, but in general, I've recruited first baseman and I've recruited second baseman. The thing is, is that if I recruit a second baseman, it's because they're a really good hitter. Maybe they're not that fast, but they can really hit. I've recruited a really good defensive first baseman who isn't the best hitter, but when I say he's good defensively at first, it's like game-changing defense. He's going to pick everything. He's going to catch everything. Shortstop, because that's such an important position, you know, you're doing double play turns, you're doing pickoffs, you're calling signs to the pitchers, you know, you have to do relay throws. I can give up a little bit of offense for a really good defensive shortstop catcher same thing you touch the ball every play so i can give up some offense for a really good defensive catcher so kind of to your point um if you are a shortstop and catcher the defense side of things is imperative if you're one of those other positions maybe offense is a little bit more important but if you're going to play shortstop or catcher you have to be really good at defense it's really important mm -hmm. cool um let me get uh, um, into a little bit more. All right. Um, so, so just to get kind of a, a picture, how does most of the recruiting uh, is done? I mean, do you, is it mainly open days or would you go and look for someone? I mean, just so we get kind of an idea and then it will help me with the other questions. Um, yeah, for sure. So, my, I'm, I'm going to speak in terms of how I think is probably the best way for you living in Israel to do it. If you are trying to come play in the States potentially as a college player. Um, something that I know some guys are able to do is come over to America for a couple of weeks and maybe go to a different college camp or a showcase. That's great if you can do that. But also, I know it's not easy to do that. You may not be able to. Um, my recommendation coming from Israel is the following. Identify a bunch of different schools that interest you. You can talk to Tal. You can talk to Asaf. Ophir, obviously, is going to be able to give you some ideas with different schools. I would apply to those schools as a student before even worrying about baseball if you like the school. And the reason why I say that is if you get admitted to a school, sometimes that makes it easier to be on a baseball team. Now, what I am not saying is apply to Vanderbilt and then call Coach Corbin, who's the head coach there, and say, oh, I want to be on the baseball team. Because if he's never heard of you, Vanderbilt's the best school in the country. That's going to be a really hard place to play at. But what I'm saying is there may be some schools that – while speaking with Ophir, maybe speaking with Asaf. Asaf can give you guys some really good info. Tal can, they played college baseball. Maybe they can give you some insight if they think, hey, you can play at this level or you can play at this level. And then you start applying to some of those schools 
And if you get in there, then you can start reaching out to the coaches. And I think that's going to really help. And then at the end of the day, once you get to the States, um, anything can happen. You can keep moving. I think the junior college route, which is what both Tal and Asaf did, is great. Uh, junior college is two years. It's a lot more affordable. So you're not paying too much money to go to school. You're going to get a, a, an associate's degree, and then you can develop and maybe go to a four-year school after that. If you're not sure exactly where to go, both of those guys did that. I think it's a good idea. But from coming from out of the country, I think that's probably going to be the easiest way for you guys to make this work. Identify a list of all different schools you want to go to, all different levels, junior college, division three, division two, some division ones, and maybe apply to those schools academically. And then once you start hearing back, let's get in touch with the coach and go from there. Good. So what I'm saying is, um, so when you look at a new recruit, do you also look at the way that they I don't know, warm up, uh, deal with their peers around them? I mean, do you kind of look at a player uh, yeah. as a whole? You know yeah. what I mean? Rather than just his baseball skills. I'm like, ah, this guy doesn't look, you know, doesn't look like he's fitting in. Doesn't like, yeah. Is it part of it? So I asked our players about a month ago. I said to our infield, I was working with our infielders. I said to them, Hey, okay, I know you guys watch a lot of hitting. You watch your hitting videos. How much do you guys watch major league infielders? I said, do you watch it a lot? They raise their hand and they say, yes. And I, I asked them, okay, how much do you watch infield? And they go, well, I watch major leaguers like once a week. It's not enough. It's not enough. If you want to be really good at this game, you need to mimic or emulate, copy the best players. You guys met Danny Valencia the other day. Go watch videos of Danny Valencia playing defense. Go watch how Danny Valencia warms up. You watch videos of the best players warming up down the baseline. That's what we want to see. You have to copy those guys. Because if you're just kind of messing around all the time, again, I'm not saying not to have fun, but like just to give you an example, I, I went to go watch a kid in high school one time, and he was warming up down the line, throwing knuckleballs nonstop to his partner. He was an outfielder. But he was throwing knuckleballs, just messing around. The ball's going over his partner's head. He's balancing the ball. I left before the game started because I'm like, it's not worth my time. This kid doesn't take it seriously. You know, so I'm not telling you it has to be like, you know, the military. It doesn't have to be like that. It should be fun. But my best advice for you is watch a video of how guys in the majors, how they warm up. They're loose, relaxed. They look confident, but they're focused. Their mechanics are good. Um, do what they do, and that's going to help stand out to other coaches. All right. Um, I'll ask a couple more, and then I'll open it up to the floor so the kids can, can interact a little bit, but just to get some things out of the way. Um, so let's talk a little bit more concrete. I mean, just so they get a, an idea of numbers. What would be an average 60-yard dash for, uh, you know, for a college ball player? Sure. And just before I forget, because um, I was actually working with Asaf about this, um, if you don't have one, you should try to put together a little highlight video. And it doesn't have to be professional. You could do it on your cell phone. I bring this up with the running because having video of you running is also good. So like doing a 60-yard dash, put that on video, put a few swings hitting on video, a few defensive videos, and put that all together. And that way you can email it out to coaches when you send them an email so they see who you are. So it's helping us. How out. long would you think, how long would you think a video like this needs to be? I mean, that's good because people can just, you know, find themselves. Yeah. No more, I would say no more than 90 seconds. I'm dead serious. Like, yeah. For me, I get thousands of emails a week. Exactly. I don't have time to watch a 10 minute video. I literally, I just want to see like, if you play shortstop, three or four ground balls, three or four swings running. That's it. Outfield, same thing, three or four throws running, uh, you know, uh, hitting, catching, couple throws down to second, a couple catches. Very simple, 90 seconds, because that's going to at least give a coach a decent idea. Um, but with the 60-yard dash, in general, if you can be around like a 7.0, mm -hmm. when I say around, let's just say within like 0.3 seconds, like 7.0, 7.3, you're in the ballpark. If you're running like a 7.7, 7.8, it's not that you can't play in college. 
it just is going to make it more important that you're a really good hitter. Well, you better hit the ball. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, but I would say average running in college is right around a 7.0 to a 7.2. And then mm -hmm. the fast guys are below a 7.0. Yeah. Okay. Um, just to bounce off one of the other things, so what are some, you know, I'd say like red lights or green lights, you know, that you would see in a, for a hitter, I guess it's the easiest, uh, it's the most common thing to use. I mean, when you would watch a video or if you would go see him, what would kind of, you know, trigger it? Right. So for me, um, when I'm watching a video, again, everybody has a different opinion about this. It's very subjective. But when I'm watching videos, a lot of times I'm just comparing to like what I've seen from the best players. That's why I said, if I were you, I'd watch your video you put together and compare that to what does Danny Valencia's defense look like? How does your footwork look? How does your arm action look? Compare your video to uh, Francisco Lindor's, your video to Andrew Lynn Simmons, your video to Yadier Molina if you're a catcher. You have to compare yourself to these guys and then continue to watch your swing and watch your defense and try to be like these best players. You may never be exactly like them, but in general, you want to see their feet always moving and the swing be level, not straight uphill, trying to hit a fly ball to the sky. Um, I like simple. I don't like these guys I see trying and hit these balls 25 feet straight up in the air. It doesn't work. I'll give you a story. When I was throwing to Valencia, in the Olympic qualifiers in September, I was amazed by him. I threw all the batting practice. And when I would throw him pitches, even like two, three inches off the plate, he was still hitting line drives to right center field off the wall. And the ball was just like on a straight line. It was unbelievable. Um, he's simple. But then in the game, he's so good that maybe he gets under the ball a little bit and he hits it for like a 400 foot home run. But in practice, he's just trying to hit a line drive. So for me, that's something that's gotten lost over the last few years. A lot of guys trying to hit fly balls. Line drives. I want to see that. If I could chime in, if I could chime in for a second, I saw Miggy doing the same thing. I saw, I was at a game and I was like, why is he hitting them like line drives off the fence? And then the next round, he started taking them out of the ballpark at ease. And I realized I was just trying to get it in there and be simple. And then his next round, he's going full. That's right. All right, so what we're going to do now, basically, um, we're going to uh, open it up for you guys. If you want to talk, just raise your hands and I'll call out your name. So it's not, uh, you don't have to raise your hands with the Bluetooth. You can just, let me lower these. All right. Uh, and let's see if that works good for us. All right, so if you want to say something, if you have a question, just raise your hand. I'll try and call you out as we go. Good? Good. All right. What is the question? I want to have more. Anyone? All right, so let me ask you another one from here. Let's see there. You're not participating or not telling me. Uh, well, I'll, I'll ask a question, a follow-up. Josh, Josh has a question. I'll feel Josh has a question. Okay. Ah, wait, okay, sorry. Josh, okay. speak up. Wait, uh, Josh, you can unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah. How do um, walk-ons work at schools? Sure, it's a good question. Um, yeah, I don't know if I mentioned too, so anything recruiting-wise, definitely ask. I'm our recruiting coordinator at Richmond, so I do all the recruiting. Like, that's my biggest job. Uh, but with walk-ons, so Division One, there is a roster limit that is, a, according to the NCAA, you cannot have more than 35 players. So at the division one level, walk-ons are a little bit more difficult. You have scholarship money, but there's also a roster limit. So as a walk-on at a division one level, it is very difficult to basically make yourself known and get a spot on the team. Division two, division three, junior college, um, they don't have roster limits. So the reason why I bring that up is if you're a good player and you go to one of those schools, if you're a walk-on, you're probably going to have a good chance to be on the team. And then once you're on the team, you know, you have scrimmages, practices, you can get a starting spot. Like that can happen easier. So for a walk-on, just be careful. If you go to Division One. it doesn't happen a whole lot just because of how limited you are with the roster number. 
Um, also, I want to I wanna just say something, you know, just so we get a little bit in the proportion for all you guys. Um, there's also a huge difference for you, whether you have an American passport or not, all right? I mean, that's a huge, huge difference in what are your options, what you can and can't, or how much it will or won't cost. Um, it, it doesn't mean you can't. I mean, Asaf doesn't have one, Tal doesn't have one, for instance, uh, but it's just a little different. If you have one, it's a little easier to get into the community colleges, to get through all these things. Um, but just that's something to keep in mind. Doesn't mean you can't, it's just something, it'll be a little bit of a different path uh, for you and, and more expensive too. Yeah, and uh, so with the walk-ons, you have a better chance to be a walk-on, meaning um, you're not on a scholarship, maybe you weren't recruited, but you go there and you make the team at a division two or division three or a junior college school, just because they're not gonna have a limit on how many players they're allowed to keep. Um, to become a walk-on, you have to get in touch with the coach. That video I told you will help. Um, and uh, I think you need to also utilize your connections. So Ophir just mentioned, Asaf, you know, he has connections as a JUCO player. Tal played junior college. Uh, Division two, you got to talk to guys who have been to the States that know, hey, you might be a good fit here. You might be a good fit here. And then maybe they can help put you in touch with some of the coaches as well. Um, so hypothetically, anyone that goes to a D2 or a D3 college could play for that team with no maximum. As long as the coach wants to keep you. The coach, he could cut you if he doesn't think you're good enough or won't help the team. But that's what I'm saying. If you can provide value, you're competitive, you're fast, you hit well, you play good defense. If he thinks there's a chance that you can help the team, then you could be a walk on on that team. It's just at division one, if they already have 35 players, you could go and try out for the team and the coach thinks you're really good, but there's no roster space. So you can't be on the team. Okay. Liam, you're up. Yeah, what's that? I can't. Uh, I don't. I came in a bit late, so I don't know if you talked about. This. Sorry, uh, sorry, but uh, as a recruiter, what's the main things you look at a catcher defensively? For sure. So that's that's a good question. Um, receiving is to me the most important thing. Um, everybody likes to see what the pop time is. You know how fast you get the ball to second base. But here's the thing. Guys who don't have the best arms behind the plate can still throw uh, base stealers out if, if they have a good transfer, if they're accurate and put the ball near the base, and if the pitcher doesn't take forever to get the ball to home plate. Um, here in the States with pitchers, we really focus on being quick to the plate because that allows our catcher a chance to throw a guy out. So even though at these showcases, they always want to show your arm, to me, what's more important is how well are you at catching the ball and making pitches that might be borderline strikes look like a strike. Um, what I'm going to actually do after this, there's a really cool video that was posted about the catcher for Davidson College. Davidson's actually one of our rivals. We play them in our conference, but they have a catcher who is really good and it shows him receiving the baseball all different ways. And when you watch him, you will see how he makes every pitch look like a strike. So I want you to go watch some of the videos of Yadier Molina. Watch what he does with how he tries to bring his glove up, about how he gets wide, how he drops to a knee, how when he catches the ball, his body doesn't move. When he catches a ball coming to him at home plate from a pitcher, he doesn't go like this. He doesn't jer jerk his body all over the place. He literally goes – Boom, everything is quiet, boom. So now it looks like to the umpire, it's a strike. And for the pitcher, they're gonna like throwing to more. So more than anything, it's receiving. You can get good at doing uh, single-handed receiving uh, drills with tennis balls. Um, you can receive baseballs, weighted balls, like any of those like driveline balls, work on catching those with one hand to get good at sticking it. But receiving to me is the biggest thing. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, so I got two questions and I don't know if I can ask both of them, but the first one is, uh, as a scout, if you see a pitcher, his, his velo is not that high, 
Yes. But still, like, what do you look for from a, uh, from a pitcher like this? Like, you can throw that hard. Absolutely. It's a good question. So, and I apologize. I'm actually just looking for that, that video because I want to post the link. Mm -hmm. I want you guys to see this catching video. It's really cool. All right, I just posted it in the, in the chat. If you have a chance, look at that video. Amazing catcher. And I want you to see what I'm talking about. He's great. Um, so pitching, our team ERA before our season got canceled this year was a 6.7. Do you guys know how bad that is? Yeah. To start every game on average, we were giving up about seven runs a game to the other team over nine innings. And that's not even consider, considering when our team makes an error and there's an unearned run, 6.7. We had a lot of pitchers that threw hard. We had guys throwing 92, 93, and they couldn't find the zip code of the strike zone. It doesn't matter. I can't stand that. I, Literally, this question is now getting my juices flowing because I'm so mad about how bad our pitchers were this year with throwing strikes. It happens with more teams than you think. If you can throw strikes with all of your pitches, it doesn't matter how hard you throw. Now, at the Division I level, at the professional baseball level, yes, your options may be a little more limited if you throw 70 miles an hour because at the Division I level, Typically, you can find a lot of pitchers who throw 85, 90, who throw strikes with a lot of pitches, and that works. But Division II, Division III, junior college, and even some Division I schools, we all have kids on our team who don't throw that hard. Uh, we had a kid on our team who was throwing like 78 this year, but you know what? He threw a changeup for a strike, slider for a strike, curveball for a strike, and he could put his fastball wherever he wants. So from a velocity standpoint, if you don't throw very hard, that's okay. If you don't throw hard, though, you better be able to spot your pitches and throw strikes with all your different pitches. Because, again, if you can throw the hitter's timing off, whether you throw 70 or 100, throwing strikes is the most important thing. Um, and my second question is, like, when you ever go to watch a player play, do you ever take into consideration, like, let's say – He's an amazing player and he's doing everything great, but he struggles to fit in with the team. Sure. So that, that's a good question. Um, one thing I always do is I always talk to the coach about the kid. You'd be surprised. A lot of coaches are more honest than you may even realize, and I'll tell you why. I'm talking to a travel coach, and I'm recruiting one of his players. Hey, what do you think about him as a kid? I literally had a coach one time tell me he's not that competitive and I don't know how badly he wants it. And the reason why he was telling me that was because he doesn't want me to recruit a kid when he lies to me about it. And then now in three years from now, when he has a player who actually is good enough to play for me, I don't trust his word because he lied to me. So I do take that into account, but a lot of times I get that information from your coaches. And this reiterates why it's so important to be a good person, to be a good teammate. Most importantly, because in life, you know, you talk about being a mensch or doing a mitzvah, like just be a good person. Takun olam, like that's, that's what Judaism teaches. Like that's, that's how I live my life. You should want to be like that anyway. But I think a good coach also practicing takun olam and being honest and just doing the right things if you're not a good kid, I'm not going to tell a college coach that you're a good kid because then you're never going to trust my word ever again. So I take that into account um, because at the end of the day, in college baseball, I mean, we spend 30, 40 hours a week together on the bus traveling, playing games, practicing. If you have a kid who's a bad kid, it makes it really, really unenjoyable. And let's say if it's the opposite, it's like the greatest teammate you've ever seen and and it's like, you want it bad, but if skill and abilities are like a bit limited, yeah. do you still want him on your team? Absolutely. And I'll tell you here, here's the thing. Uh, let's say, let's say there's three levels of players, an A player who's the best, a B player who is okay, and a C player who is terrible. If you're a C player and you have a great attitude, I may not want you because I need an A-level player. 
But if you're a B-level player, so you're close baseball-wise, and you're a great kid, that could take you to the next level because you want good kids. The other thing I've seen, too, is college baseball, when you get to college, a lot of kids in America, all they want to do is party. All they want to do is do other things away from baseball. They just want to be hooligans, act crazy. Well, that hurts them baseball-wise. If you're a good kid and you work hard and you want to get better, when you get into a college and you're working every single day hard for a whole school year while other kids are partying and doing dumb things, you're going to go this way, they're going to go this way, and all of a sudden you're going to be better than them. So the attitude is really important. Okay, thank you. Zeb, you have a question? Zeb, sorry, Zeb. Um, yeah, thanks for speaking with us. Um, I just wanted to ask what physical attributes you look for when you're recruiting players, like in your prospective recruits. Like, yeah. yeah. I got you, yeah. Baseball's a great game because it doesn't matter how big or small you are, you can provide value. That's what it comes down to for me in baseball. You have to provide value. If you are five foot six, if you are five foot five, is it going to be a little bit harder for you to be really good? Maybe, but maybe that makes you faster. Maybe you have a really good baseball IQ. You know how to play the game better than a kid who's six foot four. Personally, I have no physical attributes that I need. Not all coaches are like this. That's my philosophy. Jose Altuve, not a big guy. He's pretty darn good. I know some coaches that say you can't pitch for our program unless you're six two or taller. If that's the case, you know what? Like I'm five foot nine. I don't want to go to a program like that. If that's what they think. I don't want to go there. So I'm not going to go there. Um, but in terms of physical attributes, again, I think it's important to be honest with yourself. How big are you? How small are you? If you're five foot four, it may not be the best thing for you to try to hit home runs all the time. Get really good at bunting. Get really good at hitting line drives. Now, if you're five foot five and you can hit like Jose Altuve, then you can hit home runs. But if that's not you, listen, not a lot of guys are very good at bunting anymore. Get really good at bunting. That's a way you can differentiate yourself. Bunting for a hit, um, hitting line drives through the holes. Try to become the best you can given the physique you have, because we all know this, um, you know, you only have so much control over how tall you are. You have some control over how strong you get if you work hard, lift weights, eat healthy. But at the same time, you don't have complete control. Your body can only get as big as, as genetics allow you to get. Yeah, so I'm saying, do you, when you're recruiting athletes, do you look at their physicality and their strength and are those things that stand out to you and you take into account? I do, but like I said, it's just not, it's not the biggest thing for me. You know, when you get to college, you're going to put on more weight. You're going to get stronger. Our guys are in the weight room four days a week. So I don't care what they look like in high school. By the time the spring comes around, their first year of college, they will look nothing like they did when they first got to school. They'll be way bigger and stronger. So, yeah, with that standpoint, I don't really care. Uh, all right, Nate, before we sum up, I would like to uh, <clears throat> maybe take this opportunity to paint them like a picture. I mean, what was the, you know, like in five minutes, I don't know, six minutes, whatever. How, how, does, this, how does a college season look like? All right, like from when we start the year, uh, what are the practice schedule looks like, what are they expected to do, how many practices, how much on the field, off the field. I mean, just kind of to try and run through, you know, a general college season, you know, just to get an idea. Right. Um, well, Ophir, let me ask you this, just because I don't know. I mean, I'm curious, but like, so when you're in the military in Israel, mm -hmm. um, after school uh, ends and you're in the military, does the military kind of, uh, structure your whole day? Like is your whole day around? Um, it depends. So it depends what you do. Um, for the most part, the answer is yes, but it's not like in the U.S. I mean, because the bases are all inland. Everything is here. So people still, most of the people come home every day uh, right. if they're not combat. Obviously, the, the more combat you are or the more, you know, you do. So the more you're on the base. Uh, we also have uh, also have the ability to become an athlete soldier, uh, like Zev is now. Um, Itai and Ido got it for next year. We have a few. And then they, 
they take into consideration your practices and tournaments and stuff like that. So your service is, is, is more lenient. Um, right. So the reason why I asked is because, um, and it's interesting, when I was in Israel in January, I took the train system and I saw a lot of the idea of soldiers going home, you know, so I understand what you're saying. But the reason why I ask is because when you're a college athlete, your day is basically fit around baseball. And that's how I imagine it probably is with the military. So you wake up, you got to go to work. You got to serve in the military, do your training. You have lunch with your team, all that stuff. You go home at the end of the day. College baseball is kind of like that. So in the morning, for us this year, I'll just give you the idea of how it was for us at Richmond this year. We had lift four days a week in the morning, starting at 7 a.m. So guys were getting up at about 6. They have breakfast, come to the weight room. They lift from 7 to 8 a.m. They go to the locker room and shower, then they go off to class starting at 9 a.m. Then from about nine or so to noon, they have class, they go get lunch. After lunch, they come back to the athletic center and we have practice. Practice for a couple hours and after practice, they'll go eat dinner and then they go do their studies for the night. So that's basically a practice situation. Now, if we had a game, you could basically replace the game we're playing with the practice and it's kind of the same structure. So in general, everything is kind of surrounded around baseball and then you're gonna basically have one, maybe two days completely off. But in general, that's kind of your schedule for about five or six days a week. Mm -hmm. All right, and how many games a season most? Yeah, so that again, that will also vary by what level of college you play at. For division one, the regular season is 56 games. In Division Three, it's 40 games, not including the playoffs. Division Two is in the 50s, but in general, you're thinking it's about 40 to 50 or so games, depending on what level you're at. Okay, good. All right. Um, so just I will summarize a little bit of what you said. Just... Uh, I feel it. You mind? Yeah. Hey, Nate. hey, what's okay. up? Good to see you. Hey, how's it going? Good to see you too, Nate. Um, two questions for you. Yeah. Let's. I'm dreaming. I'm dreaming big. I'm not. Okay, if JUCO or anything, because I want D1. Yes. So what's the path for that? Always, I always say dream big, and worst case scenario, I um, might hit lower. Or right now, the Olympics got delayed. Some uh, U18 guys here, that would be too old for the U18 team. Do you think there's any path for them to make it to the team? For which one? The, the Olympic team. T talk to our man, Peter Kurz. He has those answers. Okay, Peter Kurz? Yeah. And how about the D1? Yeah. Yeah, because honestly, like, I don't really have any influence or say with the Olympic team. Um, I'm just kind of there for, like, skill development, player development to help them, you know. Train. Okay. Um, so you're saying for Division One, like, how do they get to it? What's your question? What's the, yeah, what's the process? If I'm 16, sitting at home, I'm all hyped, think uh, sky's the limit. Yeah. Instead of just, I don't, I don't be Juco, I want to be the top. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, first and foremost, like you, I know you guys are practicing hard, but you got to make this a priority. Uh, if you want to be good at it, the kids in the States, I mean, these kids are training, playing six, seven days a week. Now, some of them are not playing for the right reasons. Like I asked you at the beginning, why do you play baseball? They're playing because mom and dad want them to, and they're not happy. That's not good. But then there's a lot of kids who are the best they absolutely love playing baseball. It's all they want to do. So literally, if they have two hours, three hours a day free after school, that's what they're doing. Most kids playing at the Division One level, they play all the time. So if you want to do that and you're in Israel, I know sometimes the resources are a little limited. You may have to travel to go to a field. You guys got to figure something out. Maybe get a net for your backyard. If you can just hit off the tee, you can throw into walls. I know Ophir has been posting some drills. You've been seeing stuff like that. Yo, all that stuff. That works. When I was growing up and I was in sixth grade and I had that dream, like I told you, to play Division One baseball, sixth grade, I was literally coming home from middle school every single day and I was hitting off of the tee in my basement for an hour. I was obsessed. So that's the first thing. You better be working hard every single day because that's going to make a big difference. And then the second thing is put together a video and send that out to the college coaches like I was talking about. But keep the video relatively short. Thanks. So, so it's possible. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Appreciate it, Nate. You're welcome. I have one follow-up question uh, on what uh, 
you do ask beforehand. We haven't had a lot of questions about pitching, so I want to get one more pitch, uh, question about pitching in here. Yes. Um, you said that velocity doesn't matter that much. Uh, one question that I had is, how are you able to see someone who is not throwing at high velocity right now, but you're able to tell, oh, mechanically wise, if he just uh, tweaks a few things here and there, he's going to be able to throw five, 10 miles an hour faster. Are you looking at someone like that and be able to say, oh, this guy could potentially throw faster? So I am not a pitching coach. So I'm not like the best. We all have our expertise. So I'm not a pitching coach, but there's a lot of things that I've learned and I'll just kind of show you standing up. Um, just in general, this is interesting. So if you watch, this is another thing to watch. Like as a hitter or a pitcher, you can watch slow motion videos. Do you guys know what that is? Have you seen that before? Mm -hmm. I watch, yeah. okay, I watch that all the time. Like I'll type in on YouTube, uh, John Lester slow motion pitching or, you know, what Roy Halladay slow motion pitching, whoever your favorite pitchers are. And what you're going to see is in general, in general, when the pitcher's front leg, and I'm lifting my knee up here, gets down and their foot hits the ground, their throwing arm is right about here. So I don't know if that's something you've noticed, but I want you to see that. So right. when their front foot lands, their arm is here. Now, I'll see a lot of amateur players, kids in high school, whatever, when their front foot lands, their arm might be here, or their arm might be here, or their arm might be here. So that's one telltale sign. When you're throwing, watch a video of yourself from the side. I'm telling you guys, go look up a picture that you know on YouTube, slow motion, and see where is their arm when their front leg lands on the mound. And I'm telling you, these pictures are all going to be here. And a lot of these pictures also, their shoulders are here. So it's in a straight line. Their shoulders are not open already. Their shoulders open once their body starts rotating. So not to get too mechanical on that, that is some stuff that I look for because basically if you're not staying closed with your shoulders and creating that whip, that can lose you velocity. And if I see that and somebody's over here and maybe they're already throwing 85, I'm like, oh my goodness. Once we get him more here when his front foot gets down, that's going to really help. But let's say you're, you're getting your arm to that position, but your shoulders are not in the same level. What, repeat what you just said. That, let's say you get your, your arm to that position, but your yeah. shoulders are not in the same level. Yeah, what about that? Like, what, what are you asking? Because you said this will get you more velo when you throw. Yes. But let's say your front hand is a bit lower than your throwing hand. But your shoulder so plane is still the same. You're talking about this, right? This yeah. versus this? Your I shoulder plane is I understand. That's a good question. So I'm a, this is one of my philosophies because this is, has to do with not just pitching but playing the infield and throwing or as a catcher and throwing. If your shoulders are ever like this, that's not a good thing. But listen, it's when your front foot hits the ground. So if I'm hitting and I'm starting like this and I stride and when my front foot hits the ground, if I'm like this, I'm in trouble because I just lost all this leverage. When my front foot gets down as a hitter, boom, I want my shoulders level. When I'm pitching, same thing. If I'm here while my leg is up, when my front foot lands, I want to be here. If I'm like this, that's going to actually throw off your accuracy, and it doesn't allow your body to rotate properly. So, again, look this up. Go on YouTube. Watch slow motion videos of hitting and pitching, and what I want you to look at is, where are their shoulders? Where are their bodies? Where's their arm when their front heel gets into the ground? You're going to see what I'm talking about. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thanks, Dave. Okay, so just to sum it up a little bit to get you guys an idea. So for those of you who do want to do want to take it to the next step and see college as an option, so like you said, the first thing is to really identify uh, where do I want to be, you know? what. And, and I can say from my experience, for instance, what state was I going to play in or where was I going to spend my, my time in college was a big factor. I didn't want to go somewhere cold, for instance. I don't do good in cold weather. So I narrow my options to where it's warm most of the year and, and, and what it means, all right? So, and it depends. What is more important to you and where is more important to you and these things will change, but set a goal. 
identify these places and then start the process of getting to know, to familiarize with people there, contacts, and use what you can. If it's us, the coaches, or if it's friends or people that you know or contacts that you made during the year, use it. Don't, don't be afraid to ask. Um, Nate, thanks a lot for this. I hope we can do this more uh, more often. Um, but I really appreciate you know the time coming out here to talk to the guys. Yeah, for sure. And uh, I don't know if Josh had another question. If you have to go, that's fine. But I'll stay a couple extra minutes if anybody has some more questions. Um, no problem. I'll leave I, this open for a couple minutes. I got to go to another one. And I'll just leave this open. Uh, okay. Thank you, Afir. Thank you very much. See you guys. Guys, I'm going to put my email address on here as well if anybody wants to contact me, okay? Um, can I ask one last question? Go for it. Um what is the role of college baseball because i know like are you looking for who's the best right now or are you trying to develop players so when they're seniors they're going to be doing like really well and because i know like in that's the difference in between minor league and independent ball that minor league you're trying to get to the major leagues and independent ball you're just right. trying to be, have the best team on the field right then so yeah. what's it like in college ball it's a great question so we need to win in college ball because especially at the division one level, and it depends, it depends on where you're coaching, believe it or not, some schools care more about winning than other schools. Okay. At Richmond, they want us to win. So if we don't bring in good players and we lose, we get fired. We got to win. Um, some of the lower division schools, the goal is still to win. The coaches are competitive. Who doesn't want to win? If they don't win, then as a result of that, they may not lose their job. So because of that, I would say at the Division I level, they want guys who can come in and play now. If you're a guy that may develop, maybe you'll help them. But again, um, in general, most coaches are going to say, we want a guy who can come in and help us win now because otherwise we could lose our job. But again, talking about all the different things we've talked about, if you show a really good tool, you're coming from Israel, honestly, maybe you just haven't played the game as much as some of the kids in the States. If you're really fast, you run a 6260. If you throw hard, you throw 90 miles an hour. If you throw strikes with all of your pitches, but the velocity isn't there yet, and a coach knows, hey, in Israel, they just don't play as much as they play in America because it's not as easy. There's no high school teams, stuff like that. Somebody might say, okay, we'll bring him in. Um, in general, they want you to be good now, but given certain, cir certain circumstances, they may want you to, you know, come and, and try to develop. Hey, Nate. Okay. Um, uh, one last thing, if you have time. Yeah. Wait, bouncing off what you just said now, the pitching level in, the, in, the, in Israel and what the kids face here, honestly, it's not that high compared to what's based in the States. So all these hitters, they get to these – European tournaments on a high level or their personal tournaments in the DR and the United States, how would you recommend? I can't, I can't face a guy who throws 85 in high school when I'm a senior. That's a great why, question. Why look at me. I'm going to give, give you guys a, a quick story. When I was a freshman in yeah, high school, good. when I was a freshman in high school, so in our, in our backyard where I grew up, we, we, bought, we bought a batting cage made by Franklin. It was literally like 40 feet. It costs like 300 bucks. So, yes, a lot of money. But for how much use I got out of it, trust me, it was worth the money because I was in there every single day, every day through high school. It was right in our backyard. So we got an L screen, and my dad, he would throw to me, you know, in the, L, in, in the cage. We didn't have a pitching machine. We were facing a team that had a pitcher throwing like 90 miles an hour, and I'd never really faced that before. So I said, hey, dad, can you throw me batting practice? He said, sure. So I set up the L screen 20 feet in front of home plate. And he's just like, you want me to throw from here? I said, yes. And then that game the next day, I ended up getting three hits. It didn't even feel like he was throwing hard. So that's my advice for you. If the pitching isn't as fast in Israel, that's fine. When you practice to get used to what you would face in America, in Europe, in some of these other tournaments, the Dominican, whatever, if you move the L screen up, and just have somebody throw hard to you, that'll simulate faster pitching. When you do that, wear a helmet because he's close. So if you don't react, I don't want you to get hit in the head. Wear a helmet. 
If you have a pitching machine, you can try to put the velocity up a little higher. You could even do this, and I'm serious. Put the L screen really close and just do underhand tosses and have the person tossing to you just flip it real hard because what that's forcing you to do is you have to time it up so maybe when their arm goes back, you're working on getting your set so you can time it up as if you're facing a fast pitcher. So just reduce the distance in terms of how, how close they're throwing, and that'll actually replicate the faster pitching. Like I said, just wear a helmet if you're doing overhand tosses. Sounds good. Thank you. Appreciate it. You got it. Hey, one more fun drill for you. Um, yeah. Here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you one more link because this will show you what I'm talking about. I'm not trying to plug my Twitter, I promise. Uh, I'm not really, <laughs> I, I just want you to see this. Follow at Nats Jew Boy right here. What's that? Follow at Nats Jew Boy. Yeah. yeah. All right. So I just posted a link. This is my Twitter page, and this is me doing a drill that I kind of created. Um, if you watch it, we're working on some tag plays here at the bag, and I do it with tennis rackets. Um, this is the same idea with the fast pitching idea I just told you about. So if you know anybody who plays tennis, who's maybe good at tennis, or you just have a tennis rack and get some tennis balls. My dad, he played tennis growing up, was not a baseball player. What I used to do with him in the street, I would get a tennis ball, I'd toss it to him, and he'd wind up like he's hitting a forehand. He would hit at me as hard as he could. I had a glove. I played infield. But you can do this as a catcher, too. You can do this as an outfielder working on ground balls. Um, he would hit balls with top spin, side spin, slices. He would just rock it at me. And what that did for me was it sped up my eyes. It sped up my brain. So now when I went in the game, when a baseball was hit hard at me, I could react better and my hands work better to field it. The reason why I like this is because if a tennis ball is hit at you as hard as somebody can and you get hit by it, you're not going to go to the hospital. You do not probably want to work on getting a baseball hit to you as hard as you possibly can, because if you get hit, you're going to be seriously hurt. So try that tennis ball idea. And I like it too, because you don't need to be on a baseball field. You can do it in the street, literally on hard. I used to do it on concrete. It was amazing. I loved it. So. Thank you. All right. Any more, any more questions? Yeah, I have a question. Go for it. Um, now we're seeing a lot of D3 and D2 players making it to the MLB yeah. at the high level and a lot of D1 players not making it past college or falling at not the level that they want to get to. Why, why is that they, at, they made it to D1 past these other players and not continuing forward? Yo, what's your name? Noam? No. Yo, th that, that is one of the best questions I've ever gotten. All you guys here listening to this, that is a great question. I want you to listen to the answer. Okay, the reason why, great question, thank you. To become good at baseball, you have to play. And not only do you have to practice, you have to play the game. Because I think we can all agree to this. If I'm hitting tennis balls at you, if I'm throwing batting practice, if I'm hitting you ground balls, that's a lot different than being in a game and getting a ground ball hit to you off of a live bat. If I'm throwing a bullpen to a catcher, or I'm pitching to a live hitter in a game with the pressure of competing, that's very different. So what Noam just asked was, why are we seeing D2 and D3 players make it to the majors and then you have Division I players who don't? Well, the reason why is because those Division II and Division III players went to their schools, and instead of sitting the bench for their entire career, they the went and time. played and they were in the games and they got good at playing in a game because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how far you hit a baseball in practice. It doesn't matter how hard you throw a baseball in practice. If you can't throw strikes in a game, you have no use. So that's your answer. And that's my biggest advice for you guys. Wherever you go to play in college, I don't care what the school is. It could be the worst baseball team in the country. If that's going to give you a chance to get in the game and play a lot, do that instead of just going to Division One because you're not going to get better if you're sitting the bench. Asaf, Asaf also spoke about that. He also said he went to look for playing time. Asaf, Can't get a cheerleader. Asaf has gotten so much better. I love what Asaf has done because he has went places he's going to play. And I'll never forget when he hit that double in the Olympic qualifier. You guys <laughs> feel probably, Yeah, you guys were probably watching it. I was coaching first. I was like, let's go. I'm sure you guys were all pumped. 
But again, that's because he's playing. So you got to go where you play. Just follow us off the lead. That's awesome. One of the last thing, does it matter for you if kids play from wooden bat or metal bat when you look at bat speed? For sure. So college baseball, you use metal. I'm a big believer yeah. in using what you're going to use in a game and get as good as you can at that. And the reason why I say that is because a wooden bat and a metal bat has a very different feel to it. Okay. You can be really good hitting with wood and not swing the metal quite as much as well. Um, I, you should use both. I, again, I want you to have fun. Don't feel like, Oh, I have to use metal no matter what in practice. Cause you know, I'm not going to get, if you want to use wood on a given day, go have fun. But if you're planning on playing college baseball, you should be hitting with the metal bat 95% of the time. So you get as good as you possibly can using that. That's good. Thanks, Nate. Avi, Anybody? Did Avi, or was that Noam? Hey, yeah, it's Avi Noam. Oh. Um, so, so based off what you just said, here we're like encouraged to use wood because that's what we would have used in the European like championships. So Perfect. based off of that, like, would you say that we should use wood because we're gearing up for that, or should we use metal if we want to play in college? So, okay, and I forgot about that. But, again, my point was you have to use what you're going to use. So if you're playing in the European Championship, like I know you guys won it last year, like you guys got to win that, compete. So no, it doesn't make sense to use metal if you're going to be playing in a wood con in a wood bat tournament in a week, right? Keep getting good at metal or uh, wood, excuse me. But if your end goal is to play in college, then you have to work in the metal bat too. You you can't just hit wood all the time because then when you use a metal bat, it's going to be like, what? Well, this is weird, you know? Who we got? A tie. Hey, um, I just want to know how much of a difference do you think it makes with us applying to colleges at 21 and not 18? Like, do college coaches see a 21-year-old and be like, I'd rather recruit a 17 or 18-year-old? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll tell you my thoughts on that because I've worked in college coaching for like six years now. Um, college baseball is not professional baseball. Professional baseball, they want the young kid because they have more time to get better. For me, I like all you guys because when you go to college, you probably are going to be more mature than our 17, 18 year olds that come into college that can't handle anything. You guys have all been in the military. You guys know what it means to have structure. You're regimented, you work hard, and you're mature. Like, honestly, I can't tell you how much more I enjoy speaking to like Asaf and Tal, who I feel like are super mature. And they get it compared to some of the freshmen that come to Richmond, not because I don't like that. I like all of our guys, but the kids who are coming to Richmond as freshmen, sometimes I have to talk to them. Hey man, make sure you get your homework done. It's like, I'd rather be focusing my energies on like, Hey, let's work on getting you better at baseball and you take care of your homework. So I think college coaches honestly would enjoy having older players on their team because you're going to be more mature and you get it. You're not going to be a baby. All right, thanks. Good answer. Uh, I have one more question for one of the guys here. They asked a uh, first baseman. Yeah. What, what's what looking for size wise, bat wise, defense wise? Do you want a guy who could pudge out and get size or someone that's lighter and mobile? Yeah, I, honestly, it doesn't matter. I will tell you this I'm not a huge fan in general of people who are like super overweight. And like, again, I know that seriously, like some people have health conditions where it's harder for them to lose yeah, weight. Yeah, no, obviously. Yeah, so that's understandable. But, I mean, I've seen first basemen that are super skinny and quick, and then I've seen some who are a little bit stockier. In general, I'd rather you be athletic. So if you are a little larger, but you're athletic, that's fine. We just uh, – who was it? Um, a couple of years back, I was coaching at Franklin and Marshall College. It's a Division three yeah. school. And we, we were playing a school called Ursinus College. They had a first baseman named Chris Jablonski, okay, Jablonski was probably like six ones. I actually, I'm going to look this up because I really want to know what his actual weight was or what they list him at. <laughs> That's interesting. No, because we, we also have some guys who were six one. Um, so, uh, the so question is, do you look more at their bat or do you look because if you, they pudge out, maybe their bat will be stronger. But they yeah, yeah. So, so Jablonski was listed at 6'2", 225. He was probably like 240, 250 maybe. 
he, I mean, this kid was huge, but he could hit. I mean, oh my goodness, he hit so many home runs and he was actually really athletic at first base. So it doesn't matter. You can be skinny. If you're skinny and you can hit singles, that's great. Um, this isn't professional baseball. In professional baseball, they want first baseman to hit home runs. College baseball, look, if you're hitting singles, you can pick every ball. That's fine. It doesn't matter. I would say the only <clears throat> issue for first base is that if you're like five foot five, that's probably going to be a problem just because you want to have a yeah. little height for your first baseman so they can reach some of the throws. Again, not saying you have to be six foot, but maybe like 5'10 is, is probably like a decent size or taller. And get really good at picking, you know, baseballs and throws. And a great drill to do that with is that Twitter drill I showed you guys. It hit the tennis balls. I do that with our first baseman all the time. I'll go like rapid fire tennis rackets and they just go pick, 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 pick. It gets them really good at that. That's perfect. Also, a lot of times I see guys clocking the throw from short and also from outfield. Do you care about Velo? Let's say a guy shortstop who's gunning up to first. Does this Velo matter? No. I mean, if they're throwing 60 miles an hour across the infield, which is not very good, sure, that could be a problem. If you're 75, if you're 80, that's fine. That's if good. Yeah. If you're accurate, you're fine. Oh, yeah. Sounds good. When Anybody is, else? Yeah. I have a question. Um, yeah. When did oh go for it? Uh, hey, Josh, yeah. Josh, go ahead. Ask Josh. Nate. Um, uh, guys, I'm in, did, no, I'm in no rush. I'm at home, so like when so did, you're the best, Nate. When did you decide you wanted to switch over to coaching, and what made you decide that? Because baseball isn't only for playing; there's a whole <laughs> other aspect. So. See, that, that's another interesting point. Like, if you love baseball and you want to be involved with the game for your career, you can. Uh, you guys all know Alone, right? Yeah. Yeah. Look what Alone's doing. He's a professional baseball coach. He's making a full-time salary. He's doing great. He just went and played college ball and just kept working up from there. So when did I make that decision? When I was a senior in college at the University of Rochester and I realized – probably not going to play professional baseball. Well, the game meant so much to me. I wanted to keep staying involved. So I decided I was going to stay in baseball, either as a coach, as a scout, working in a front office in like a business job, something. And then just coaching kind of happened. Um, but keep that in mind too. Like if you want to be involved with the game forever, look what Alone's doing. Look what I'm doing. There's also jobs where you can work in marketing for a team. You can work in ticket sales for a team. So if you're more like business driven or you like math, you can be a statistician. You can be an accountant for a baseball team. There's so many things that come into play here that if that's your goal too, that's great. And you should try to stay involved with a college team. Like hypothetically, if you can't play for a school that you wanted to, but you like the school and you want to go and maybe become their like manager or something that could open up other doors for you as a job for the rest of your life. Does college baseball have like front office jobs and things like that or not? Like it's mainly the manager is in charge of the team. So the managers at some of these schools, they run the jobs that a lot of these front office jobs do. So there's a lot of stories of kids who maybe were a manager and then they go on to be like a general manager of a pro team someday. Because you can be a student manager for a college team while you're a student at that university. What does a manager mean in college? It's not like a head coach. No. So at the college level, the person who runs a team is called the head coach, whereas in professional baseball, it's called the manager. In college baseball, if you're a student manager, it basically means you're helping with like logistical stuff. Maybe you're helping with practice. You're throwing batting practice. It's almost like you're a student coach is pretty much what it is. Uh, I have a question. So uh, I had a conversation with Nathan yesterday, and we, had, we got to talk about players like Michael Lorenzen or Shohei Otani who turned themselves into a two-way player. Like, they're pitchers who can still hit the ball. So, like, as a college scout or a coach, would you rather have a pitcher who can hit also? Like, you don't, you don't mind, like, if he knows how to hit or not. Right. Yeah, I got you. Um, it's, it's one of those questions of, is it worth your time? In life, you have to take costs and benefits. 
you know, is it worth it or is it not worth it? So if you are a hitter and a pitcher, but it's forcing you to spend so much time doing both that you're not getting better, it's not worth doing both. Otani can do both because he's just that good, right? So it makes sense. As a college coach, if you are a really good pitcher and a really good hitter, I love that. But if you could be a better pitcher if you stopped hitting, I'd rather you do that. If you could be a better hitter if you stopped pitching, I would rather you do that. So it just I, I, also, I also remember that Ben Wonger told me that he, he throws and he also hit. Yes. But like he, he told me that his pitching is not, he's like, it's not that good as his hitting. So like, do you see the waste of time for him to pitch? So honestly, so I think Ben, Benny was really good at USC this year. Did you guys follow him at all? Yeah, I did. Yeah, he was great. He led the average or something, batting average. Yeah, but so he did great hitting, but his pitching, I think, has opened the eyes for a lot of professional scouts. So there's a chance he can get drafted as a pitcher. But again, he's an example. He's good at both. He may say he's not, but he's good at both. So it makes sense for him to do that. Okay. Thank you. Good answer. Anybody else? Zev, what's Stop up, dude? Stop talking, Zev. <clears throat> okay, so you talked about how um, in the infield, 75 miles an hour and would work for you when these extreme physical attributes aren't so important for you and maybe a 6960 works for you. So what really stands out for you and makes the players you recruit, the players that you recruit essentially over the rest of the pack? Random. I'm dead serious. Like I'm, I'm dead serious. I know it's not a good answer, but it's like, I think about this all the time. I think that there are 5,000 different players that could play at Richmond. If I get one of them, great. So there's like a baseline level of what I'm looking for. And if I find a kid in California who has that, I'll go for him. I'll go for a kid in New York who has that, great. And if I only need two infielders, whatever the first two guys I get, that's who I'm getting. Um, so that, that's kind of what I'm trying to explain is that it's not, so, it's not so systematic where it's like, wow, this is the one kid I want. And if I don't get this kid, I want nobody. It's more like I've identified 30 infielders that fit what I'm looking for, and I want to try to get one of them. And I don't okay. care who. I don't care who. As long as they're good enough. Anybody? Thanks. Uh, I got one more. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, let's say you just uh, met the best player you've ever seen. In, he's doing everything great. He's a great teammate. He's a great guy. But his coachability is not that good. So as a coach or a scout, like, is that, how important is that to you? The play will be coachable. Yeah. So the biggest thing is, so I didn't mention this. We're with each other as a team so much. If somebody's not coachable, it makes it very unenjoyable, not fun. If you're not coachable, you better be as good as Mike Trout. Otherwise, I'm getting rid of you. Seriously. Because if you aren't that good and you won't listen to anything I try to say, then what's the point of having you there? I, th I think what he's asking more, well, what's the benefit of being coachable? Yeah. Like, would that add value to, towards you? Yeah, absolutely. Because then you have room for growth. It's, I mean, it's kind of like what I'm saying. It's like, if you have deficiencies, if you are lacking in your game and you're coachable, we can fix that. If you're not coachable, we can't fix that. So then you're always going to be struggling. See what I mean? Okay. Also... Nate, when you were in Israel, you guys saw you, you saw some of these guys pick balls and play, right? Yes. Yep. Um, how would you compare that? Let's say mirror to mirror. I right? mirror it with a 16, 17 year old guy in the states. How would like if we're on like these guys want to hear the honest truth about? Yeah. How would you evaluate um, them? So, I've what I would say is, in terms of the highest level talent, the players I saw in Israel were not there. When I say highest, like draft guys 
and high division one guys. It wasn't there. But I saw a ton of players that, in my opinion, at the age of 15, 16, with those kids that I saw, they would be in the ballparks for a division one player, maybe a lower level, and then definitely division two, division three. Now, I also saw yes. some players that I thought were not very good. You know, couldn't catch the That's... ball, couldn't swing and miss. But there's players like that in America, too. I do lessons with kids. I got kids who come in, and it looks like they're swinging with their eyes closed all the time. So <laughs> I want you to understand that. Like, in Israel, there were some really good players and some not-so-good players. And in America, there's some really good players, and there's also some not-so-good players. So, and if we, dig, if, yeah, if we dig a bit deeper for these guys, what do you think is the – Juice, that, that, that difference between the, the sky high players in the States who are covered since they're 14, 16, compared to we, – we've got some all-stars right here online right now. What do you think the difference is? Is it time work? Is it work ethic? Is it just that they have better coaches? No, I don't think it's the coach. I, I don't think it's the coaches at all. I agree I'm with you. Honestly, I honestly think it's the ability to play high-level competition on a regular basis. Like, again, what I said to you before – you guys can practice all you want, but unless you're playing you in a month, but unless you're playing five, five games, five games, you can't get good at playing the game. And playing the game is how we measure whether we are good or not. So that's the biggest difference in America, is that in America they're playing tournaments, high school games, fall games, 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 games. That's how you get good. My advice for you guys, play some pickup games. I know you have a lot of baseball, you know, with the – you know, I and if you can get some other pickup games going with your friends, you could have nine players. Because what you can do is, if you get a couple pitchers, you could just rotate the hitters through and just keep the same defense out there for like three innings, and then have some new hitters come in and send the hitters back out to the field. That's great. I think that will help you a lot. Okay, uh, lead question. Looks like. Looks like. Uh, yeah. Um, how how important is leadership? compared to actual skill for a catcher? Catcher, that's a good question. So at the end of the day, I want you to understand, if you don't have this baseline skill level, you can't play at a high level. That's really important because you could have the best leadership skills ever, but if your skill level is down here, you're just not good enough. That's it. But if you have a general skill level and you have good leadership skills and you're competitive and you're not scared to go up against the best players, that's going to raise you above. As a catcher, you absolutely need to be a leader. I'll give you an example. We had a catcher this past year who was a – he committed He committed originally to Arizona State. So huge, huge baseball school. And then he decommitted and then came to us. This Why is that? Uh, they kind of pulled his offer, just whatever, political stuff. Okay, a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't matter. So he came to Richmond very quiet. And in a game, and in a game, there was a play at the plate. He didn't. There say was a play at the plate. Said nothing. So our pitcher didn't throw it anywhere, and it cost us an out. And they scored three runs that inning, and that would have been the third out. So as a catcher, it's one of those positions that you need to be a leader. You need to be decisive. You need to just say, "I'm going to do this. This is what I'm going to say." And you have to do it. And if you don't, that's going to hurt your ability to play a good catcher position. To answer your question, you have a baseline skill level. To me, the leadership ability, being good, will take you to the next level. Very important. Avinon had a question, it looks like. Uh, yeah. At what age do you tell players that they should just, like, only focus on baseball and stop playing any other sports? My answer to that is – Never. Never. I don't. I seriously don't. I really don't like the fact that some kids give up sports. When I'm asked about this, my answer is you play whatever sports are fun for you. Now, if you want to play baseball at the next level, then you should be probably putting in more time to baseball than basketball and more baseball time than golf. But playing different sports is going to help you develop different athleticism. But here's the biggest benefit. It teaches you to be competitive in different settings. The best athletes are the best competitors. And that's also why you see some of the best athletes of all time, they played a lot of sports and it's because they learned how to compete in a basketball game, taking the last shot. They learned how to compete in a golf match when they needed to hit a par three, otherwise they were gonna lose. 
So there's a lot of mental and competitive benefits playing other sports alongside with the athletic benefits. All right. Everything. Do you, uh, I've got a question. That's okay. Uh, yeah, wait, who's got – you asked. More important than I, my questions. All right, thank you. Um, so as you said just now, um, it's very important to see how a player performs in game and mentally, and I guess you'd say the clutch gene or however you want to put it, but that he can perform well uh, in the game and in pressure situations. So why is it such, such a big thing to have showcases? Like uh, not showcase tournaments, but regular showcases. Hey, you guys are smart because that's a thing. I think, I think showcases <laughs> are a big waste of time. I think it allows coaches like me to see a general skill level, but what you're getting at, and you're right, if a kid's good at a showcase, it doesn't mean they're going to be good in a game. So here's one thing I'm going to tell you. Do any of you guys here meditate? Seriously. You ever do I was going to ask about that. You, you guys ever meditate? Yes, I do. You guys, you guys, even, do you guys know what meditation is? Yes. Regularly. Good. I like that. That's awesome. You do that. So, I meditate every single day. And I'm going to tell you right now, I didn't know anything about meditation when I was playing in college. And if I did, I think it would have made me a way better player than I was. Here's why. I'm going to paint you a scenario. You tell me, does this sound familiar? You just made an error at shortstop. You just made an error at catcher. You just struck out in a big spot of the game with bases loaded, cost your team the game or whatever. You made a big error in the outfield or as a pitcher, you just walked in a run. And now in your head, the moment after, you're beating yourself up in your head and saying, damn, I blew it. Damn, I stink. Damn, I'm terrible. Damn, I'm freaking out. And you can't get yourself just to calm down. And then all of a sudden, it compounds and something bad happens. Out. That's probably happened to all of us. So the meditation stuff to me is really important in baseball because what it teaches you to do is to calm down breathe and slow down and have some perspective to know that everybody's human and we all make mistakes. So um, I do meditation with our team all the time, just for five minutes, you know, before practice, sometimes before a game. It's not something you have to do. It's honestly not for everybody. Some kids are very hardwired to just be chill. Like, you know, we call it in, in, in America being like California, like SoCal, just yeah, bro, surfer. We're just hanging loose, relax. Some guys have that ability, you know, some people don't. So if you feel like you're one of those guys who's really hard on yourself or gets a little stressed, high strung, has anxiety, that's okay. Give meditation a try. Sit in your room, put your headphones in, close your eyes, just focus on your breathing for five minutes and don't open your eyes. And then when you finish, you can look and see how you feel. And, and then you take that to a baseball game and when you make an error, close your eyes for a few seconds, take some deep breaths, I bet you you'll feel a whole lot better, but it's like baseball. If you want to get good at this, you have to practice meditation every day, five to 10 minutes. And you can even download an app on your phone. If you look it up, different meditation apps, you can find stuff on YouTube. They have stuff on Spotify. Give it a try. But like I said, you got to do it a lot. Don't just do it like once a week. Try it every single day for five to 10 minutes. If we feed off that, Nate, I was just about to ask you, do you do mental work as a team together or does the individual tell them to do it at home? We had a catcher who – Or other places. Yeah, we had a catcher who was having trouble throwing the ball back to the pitcher. Don't know if that's ever yes. happened to anybody before. Yeah. It happens. So I took him to home plate one day alone, just him and me. We sat behind the home plate like he was catching, and we meditated there for 10 minutes. Why? I wanted him to feel relaxed in a part of the world that has created a lot of stress for him. So we kind of reverse the thought process. Normally when he's behind home plate, he's feeling anxiety and stress because he can't throw the ball back to the pitcher. I got him to relax a little bit by meditating. At the same time, sometimes we'll meditate, um, and do stuff like that in a big group setting on the field, sitting in a circle, sitting in the dugout together, and then we'll talk a little bit afterwards. So it can be done either which way, whatever is most comfortable for you. But to me, the mental toughness stuff, I think, is best done just in meditation. Because what is mental toughness? It's getting you to believe that you are capable of being successful. It is getting you to believe that the negative thoughts you have in your head are not true. And that's what meditation teaches you. Because when you meditate, 
and you're focusing on your breath, you're going to be interrupted over and over again with, wow, I can't finish this. This is taking too long. Wow, this is really hard. I want to stop. But then you have to overcome that obsession and go back to your breath, just like when you're meditating or just like when you're in a game and you make a mistake and all of a sudden you're like, damn, I just made another error. I stink. I suck. And yeah, exactly. You have to deep breath, convince yourself I can get past this thought and I'm going to now focus on the positive and make the next play. And it's over. Moshe, you got, who, anybody else got a question? Um, one more follow-up kind of thing. Um, in the end of the day, um, the mental toughness, do you believe it, it comes with preparation? So, so maybe meditating is good, but I think uh, also the, the preparation gives you the confidence to, to know that you're prepared, you did everything you can, and errors happen. It's part of the game. So, again, it really, and it's like I said before, meditation is not for everybody. Meditation is for people who need it. And if you have that mindset that, look, if you work hard and you can feel confident no matter what happens, that you're going to feel good. And if you make a mistake, it's okay because you worked as hard as you could, then that's, that's phenomenal. Maybe you don't need meditation. I'll tell you right now, I worked harder than anybody. I firmly believe that. When I was growing up, nobody worked harder than me. But when I made an error in a game, in my head, I still obsessed about it. I couldn't get past it. If I knew about meditation back then, it would have helped me. So answer your question, yes. If you feel com comfortable, confident, at peace, saying, if I work hard, I'm good, and then when you make a mistake, you can get past it by thinking of that, that's perfect. But if you need a new skill or a new tactic to help you get there, maybe meditation can help. Um, one, I don't know if uh, you want to leave Nate or anything, but um, you good? Yeah. Uh, we talk, uh, we call in Israel Tachlis, which is cut straight to the chase, about the process from uh, the, the draft every June. What would be a process for a player – like if we, if you know, like you said, Sean Casey got for the big leagues, or I'm sure other guys got drafted from Richmond. I'm positive about that. Um, what would be the process if you could share? Give us a little bit in scoop. Tomer, what are you doing? <laughs> I love Tomer. Uh, so, at the end of the day, you get, you got to put up numbers. You have to put up good statistics. See, the draft is very simple. Everybody wants to get drafted, but very few get drafted. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you don't have a good batting average, if you don't hit a lot of home runs, if you don't do something, you're not getting drafted. So pretty much it's a real simple process. Sean Casey got drafted at Richmond. You want to know what Sean Casey did? He led the country in hitting. The the hitting machine. Drafted. Yeah. So, so what is the process? Not have success not in a game. Not. The process is not – to throw 95. If you throw 95, it might help you get drafted, but if you can't throw a strike, you're not gonna be in professional baseball very long. So that's just the bottom line. Just perform in a game, get hits, get on base, throw strikes, boom. So process over product. Yes. Anyone? My man Zeb, what do you got? Well, okay, so I want to ask another question about recruiting. Um, so you see these days, like, players committing earlier and earlier, and you also said that we should kind of apply to the schools and then, and then get in contact with coaches. So how would the – and you also mentioned that you take players, the first players that you can get, essentially, the first players that you can recruit on that baseline. So what would – what does a recruiting timeline usually look for your school and what would you recommend we work around that? Like sure. so, other schools. Yeah. Yeah. So every school works on a different timeline. That's kind of the complicated part about this is that I can't give you a one size fits all answer. Um, for us, we're a very high academic school. So a lot of the kids we recruit, we need to see their transcript probably through at least their sophomore year to be able to even consider that. So we don't really commit anybody until they're a junior at the earliest. But even then, we still have kids committing into their senior year. All schools will commit kids into their senior year. 
It just depends how many. The bigger schools, the Vanderbilts, uh, Stanford, Texas, Texas A&M, they have a lot of kids committing as freshmen and sophomores. They still may get a couple seniors, just not as many as we might at Richmond because we work a little bit slower. So when I'm talking about kind of applying to the school and then maybe reaching out to the coach then, um, the Division II, Division Three JUCOs, they all take a lot longer. So if you're waiting till your senior year on those schools, you're fine. If you want to go to a Division I school, maybe you reach out to them a little bit earlier. Um, and that would probably be the best thing to do because the Division I schools do recruit a little bit earlier than the other ones. But at the end of the day, um, if you're good enough, they will take you if you're a senior. Thanks. You got it. Do you have a lot of international guys on your roster or no? Is there a so I would say in America in general, the only international players I've seen, I've never had one. Um, we actually had a kid come to one of our camps from France. France? Yeah. Canada, Canada's got a bunch of players in the States. Makes sense. Good baseball there. Uh, there's some Mexican players. There's some Puerto Rican, Dominican players. Um, so there's a ton of international players in the States. And I would say the main group that it comes from is Canada. Um, I've only really coached or played with an Israeli. Moish Lewis was the one. Yeah, you said. But it's possible. Yeah, oh, absolutely. It's definitely possible. Not, cause so far, we, the kids here have, have, haven't seen the... You, you have to do what Alone did. You have to do what Asaf did and Tom did. Not get caught up in the name of the big school. That's it. In America, these kids get caught up. They want to go to the biggest schools to tell their friends and post on social media. And you know exactly. what? They go to those schools and they don't play and nobody cares because they left. Okay. Just got to open up a door. Go, go anywhere you can play. <laughs> if, it's, if it's a good fit for you academically and you're comfortable with the college and the place of the school and you can afford it, it doesn't matter what the name of the school is for baseball. If you can play their baseball. Right. Good. We have a question from Amino. Yeah. Um, how can the student it is for us to play college ball in America coming from Israel? Uh, how, realist how realistic do you think it is for a college in America to consider us or have a spot for us coming from Israel? Um, I think it's much more realistic at the lower, the quote unquote lower level schools than Division One. Uh, just because the Division One schools can find plenty of players uh, in America that are good enough for their team. So if you're in Israel and you're that good that you're better than a lot of American players, you can play Division One. If you're not, then I think it's going to be tough. The Division Two, II, Division Three junior college schools, they're looking for guys that they can get who can be different than maybe the guys are getting. So if you're relatively good and you're equal to some of the players are getting but you're going to be more mature because you're 21 22 coming from the military that might be really appealing so i personally think it's much more practical or likely you could do it at a school that isn't division one i do think division one is possible it just means that your baseline talent level has to be way higher than maybe everybody else in israel all right Hey, if I take the top player on your team, top pitcher or top bat, and put him against the top pitcher in Israel or top bat in Israel, he's a pitcher. Well, I'll, it, I'll, compare, I'll compare it to like Asaf or Tal. Yeah. Like both of those guys can be on our team at Richmond. I don't at, know. But at, at their age. Oh. The, the Asaf, is, Asaf is 22. And like we, we have here a bunch of, we have here a 15-year-old, we have here a 16 and 17-year-old and an 18-year-old. Oh. So the, the kids going to Division One who are 15, 16, I mean, they're legitimately throwing in the 90s already. And they're throwing strikes. So, like, I mean, it's their next level stuff. So if I take them on Baptist, will it be like a joke, quote unquote, to them? Obviously, it's still, you have, still have to grind, but would it be, you think it would have, like, if we're honestly speaking here? Yeah, I mean, be just because you guys have seen Asaf and Tal, uh, 
I'm going to use them for an example at their age, whatever, yeah. what their skill level is right now. In my opinion, both of those guys can play at Richmond and be on our team. You know, my concern is, is I don't know how much they would be in the game. They might oh, get playing time again. Yeah. They may get at bats here and there, but they're not necessarily as good as our current starters. They're good enough to play. Just, they may not be the everyday players. And like I keep going back to, you got to go somewhere. You're definitely going to play. You play. So that's why I kind of bring up the D2, D3 thing. If that's where you're going to play the most, look, if you want to play professional baseball, you can get drafted if you go to one of those schools, but you have to play. And if you go Division One, just to say you did and sit the bench for four years, you have no chance. So the process is I go four years of school, then I'm supposed to, let's say I don't get drafted, I go undrafted? Right. Which uh, I would like if you could explain that to some of the guys if that's possible. Yeah, so if you go four years and play and you don't get drafted, there's various professional leagues around the country and even in other countries that are smaller. Um, the players are still really good. I mean, they're unbelievable players still, but you can get signed with one of those. Our pitching coach, actually, uh, for Team Israel, Andrew Lorraine, he played professionally in Italy for a little bit, and he pitched in the major league. So that just goes to show you, like – yeah, he played in the majors. He played in Italy. The professional league in Japan is better than, like, AAA baseball. I mean, yeah, it's AAA baseball. It, it's amazing. So um, it just really depends. But if you don't get drafted and you want to play professional baseball afterwards, you may just have to go to one of those smaller leagues. Exactly. Okay. Anybody else? I think we're good. Hey, guys, listen. I love this and I appreciate your attention and how much you guys care. And I want to help you guys. You have my email address on there. I'll put it again, just so you have it. Um, do me a favor. If you email me just cause I get so many emails uh, in the subject line, if you want to talk or whatever, just put Israel baseball on the subject. Cause that'll catch my eye. Okay. Nate, you're the best. Thank you very much. Hey, stay safe. And we'll be back on the field one day. Thank you very much. Love you guys. Excited to see you soon. Hey, thanks, thanks, man. We'll be in touch. See you guys. Bye. Bye.